With no sustainable evidence of election altering fraud delivered to the nation, President Donald Trump stubbornly clings to claims his victory was stolen. Meantime, America appears to be descending into its dark winter as the coronavirus casualty count elevates to a disturbing new level of loss. Here at home, economic hardship from the pandemic has triggered release of $30 million in direct city aid for Houstonians suffering the most. Will it be enough to ease the pain until vaccines bring welcome relief? I'm Greg Grugan and welcome to Watch Your Point where our panelists call it like they see it. Let's greet them. Starting us off, Bob Price, Associate Editor, Breitbart, Texas. Also with us, legal analyst and Houston attorney, Carmen Rowe. In the number three spot, longtime super neighborhood leader, Tamaro Bell. Also with us this morning, Charles Blaine, founder of the advocacy group, Urban Reform. And closing us out, writer, educator, and radio host, Tony Diaz. Let us begin. 33 days have passed since the November 3rd general election and President Donald Trump continues to claim the balloting in many states was rigged and a second term in office for his administration in the process of being stolen. That claim, yet to be proven in a court of law, became more doubtful this week as Mr. Trump's own Attorney General William Barr announced the Justice Department had thus far uncovered no evidence of fraud which would alter the outcome of the election. As more and more Republican leaders acknowledged the Biden victory and urged a peaceful transition, the president-elect set about the process of assembling a new administration. With that panel, I pose the question, does anyone believe this sitting president will de-escalate as we move closer to January 20th? Let's start with Charles Blaine. Listen, I mean, I think for his base, he's going to keep up the fight and try to vet through a lot of the concerns that they have. But to say that he hasn't conceded, he might not have formally said the words, but he has activated the General Services Administration to start the transition process. He's acknowledged that Biden is going to be inaugurated. When they asked him if he would attend, he said he knows the answer, but he's not going to tell folks. And he did say that he will leave the White House. So he has acknowledged that he will leave. But I think for the purpose of, of election integrity and to reassure the base that this process was fair and square he's going to push through with making sure that these lawsuits and these recounts and these ballots and every every instance that has been alleged to have been um, wronged is going to be vetted through and i don't blame him for that because people do have serious concerns about the electoral system and the democrats should be on board with making sure that everything was above board if we want to move forward collectively and unified with assurance in the system tomorrow bell as you watch this unfold what's your take on the president's actions this is, uh, I doubt if he will de-escalate delusions, because if he de-escalates delusions, he will de-escalate his defunding of his uh, money that he's raising. $170 million since the election last week? Come on now, this is not about whether he believes he won or lost. This is about money. This is about collecting money, and that is what he is doing. Whether he gonna use it for his defense now or his defense when he go, that's all this is about is for him to raise money from his base, and that's it. All right, Bob Price, there is the possibility that the president is hamstringing the efforts in Georgia. We're going to talk about that later, but I really want to get your insight on this. Well, first off, the president is fully involved in Georgia, and as we saw last night. But you know, on the point of should the president concede or not, why the heck should he concede? Al Gore didn't concede until December 13th until his case was actually heard by the Supreme Court and they came out with a ruling. The President of the United States deserves that. The 70 plus million people that voted for the President deserve this. It needs to be heard. This election has serious questions and regardless of your political affiliation, you should be concerned when election officials can unconstitutionally change voting procedures. That is the duty of the state legislatures, not some election official, not the governor of Pennsylvania not the governor of other states as well. So we need to make sure that the processes are being followed properly, that every legally cast vote is counted and every illegally cast vote is thrown out. 
that's the way it works. It's just like immigration. We, you know, we want legal immigration. We don't want illegal immigration. We don't want illegal voters as well. So let's make sure that our people are, are getting their votes counted, make sure that the process is fair, open, and transparent. You don't throw poll watchers out of buildings when you're trying to count the votes. You let people see what's going on, and then it, if you're not doing anything wrong, it eliminates that suspicion. All right, Tony Diaz, I'm assuming you believe that the states that have verified their elections uh, are, are in the right and that the Biden administration should take its place. Well, I know it was a fair election, and so does Bill Barr, who basically has been Donald Trump's right-hand man and would say and do anything for Donald Trump. Even he came out and said that it was a fair election. From this point on, it's really irresponsible. There's been about one lawsuit a day since the election that the Donald Trump administration has wasted its time on instead of really working on this COVID-19 epidemic transition. Now it's become very irresponsible. He's had his day in court. He's had several days in court. He hasn't won those cases. They can't find significant fraud. and. He should have been worrying about election fraud when he got elected because that was a conversation then. This is really sad. And every Republican that doesn't stand up against this right now is undermining the elections, but worse, contributing to the demise of Americans because we're all suffering over COVID-19, be they Republican or Democrat. That's what should be the main issue of former President Donald Trump and President-elect Biden. He's still the president, Tony. Did not. Win, though. Okay, hold on, you uh, guys. Hold hold on. We strategically close with Carmen Rowe for a clear-eyed legal analysis. Carmen, do you see any evidence so far of widespread fraud that would change this election? Well, first of all, let me say, I don't think anybody should be surprised that Trump is doubling down. But let me say this about that. William Barr did not say that the election was fair. Nobody is going that far. What they're saying is, is that there is some evidence of fraud, but that fraud doesn't rise to the level that it would have impacted the outcome of the election. And so to me, the Republicans and Trump are basically indicting the, the entire voting process and suggesting that there's not fairness in that process and we need to look into it. Now, is that a self-serving thing for Trump? Sure. But it's still an issue and it's one that needs to be looked into. And there's several people here in Texas, as well as across the country, who think that it's an issue that needs to be looked into because there is evidence. It's just not enough. And in each one of these court cases, it's the same issue. Yes, there's fraud, not enough to change the election, and therefore they lose. But it doesn't mean it's not an issue. All right, we're going to leave it right there. Up next. Will the outgoing president who says he's done nothing wrong make the unprecedented move of pardoning himself? Plus, Houston City Council greenlights thousands of cash payments for those suffering severe hardship from the pandemic. Welcome back. Much ink and thousands of hours of broadcast time were devoted this week to speculation over a single question. Will President Trump exercise the unprecedented option of preemptively pardoning himself, his family, and many of his closest associates? Panel, I'm told the smart money in Vegas is squarely on the commander-in-chief, generously distributing this impregnable shield from future federal prosecution. Let's start with tomorrow, Bell. Hell yeah. I'm done. (laughs) Are you kidding me? Hell yeah. That's it. He will pardon himself, his family, and his friends. All right, Bob Price, should he do that? Well, uh, under normal circumstances, I would think it'd be a pretty strange thing to do. And there's a lot of legal debate about whether the president can actually pardon himself or not. But he can certainly pardon his family, and he can pardon those that have worked for him. And under the current political environment where we're criminalizing the political process and trying to act like a third world country that's going to go out after the the party that's left office and and filed criminal charges against them, I I certainly would not blame him for issuing as many pardons as he thinks is necessary. And maybe it it is a time for him to pardon himself and and actually get that challenge through the process and see, see what the legal outcome of that is. But the president has unprecedented powers in that. Carmen Roa, I suspect you've taken a dive into the law surrounding this power. Uh, What's your point? 
Uh, can he do it? Yes. Will he do it? No. Because he's going to have to acknowledge that he's done something that's wrong or criminal or that his family has, and there's no way that he would do that. And so I don't think there's a lot of doubt about whether he can do it, uh, but no president's ever done it before. And so because it's Trump, no, I don't think it's even a close call whether he will. Charles Blaine, if the president does uh, pardon himself, does that cause some residual damage moving forward? I mean, he is still the head of the party and has lots of hardcore supporters. Yeah, I think it's going to cause some damage to the party. I mean, I think Republicans are going to have to explain that away for a while. And do I think he should do it? Probably not. It's entering a really weird territory. But I also think of it in a different way that, you know, if he does pardon his kids, I think, and, and he truly believes, and I think a lot of people do believe, and I, I, I'm kind of partial to this as well, that a lot of what has gone on these past four years is a witch hunt. And if and you take him not being the president and just look at it as a father, if you're if a father thinks that his kids are, are targets of a witch hunt, why would he not pardon them if he has the, the power to do so? And so I can see why he would. Do I think he should? Probably not. Okay, based upon that rationale, Tony, you're actually hoping the president pardons himself. <laughs> That's an admission of guilt if he does so. And oh, the sad God. part is that we as American citizens, at one point we had access to a cell phone plan that was called Family and Friends. Donald Trump, because he's past Al Capone's gangster level of corruptness, he has access to a Family and Friends pardon plan. I think it's an abuse of power. It's an embarrassment. And folks, he's basically going where Nixon dared not go. He's worse than Nixon. We all thought he was shady. This would prove it. All right, we're going to leave it right there. Still ahead, can Republicans <laughs> retain control of the U.S. Senate? It's all dependent on a pair of Georgia runoffs. We're going to talk about the prospects and ramifications after the break. Welcome back. In the ongoing struggle to seize or retain power over this nation's government, all eyes are now squarely focused on the state of Georgia and its two Senate runoffs set for January 5th. If either Republican wins, the GOP maintains narrow control of the upper chamber. But if Democrats sweep both seats, Democrats will snatch the Senate and deliver both houses of Congress to an incoming Biden administration. Question, will moderate Georgia voters turned off by Mr. Trump favor maintaining a Senate firewall preventing complete Democratic rule? I'm going to start with you, Charles Blaine. What do you think of that scenario? Listen, I, I do think that. I think that there people see what's going to ha what can happen if you have two houses that are controlled and the same party as the presidency. And so they're going to want to have some sort of firewall to stop some of the things that we've been hearing that the left wants to push for. And we know that the progressives are demanding that Joe Biden put more progressive nominees up and push more progressive policies. So you're going to need something to stand in the way. But I think the problem is Republicans can't get out of our own way because we're consistently fighting with each other rather than fighting with the Democrats in Georgia. This week we we're saying some republicans are out there saying why even go vote if the process is flawed others are attacking those republicans for saying that so we're too busy fighting each other than getting on the ground and doing the work in georgia so i'm hoping to pull off a win so that we can't have that firewall but we've got to stay focused and keep our eye on the target okay uh tony diaz now polls haven't been particularly <clears throat> accurate but both democrats appear to have slight leads are you hopeful in georgia uh, and plus, we have some confusion. We have uh, lawyers who have said for the president saying, hey, don't vote for any of these guys. Uh, what's your take on what's happening in Georgia? Democrats got to work hard, and they are. Actually, Julian Castro is going to be on the ground starting this week to reach out to the Latino vote. There's an awesome cartoonist, uh, Chicano artist, Lalo Alcaraz, who's already working with a lot of the grassroots organizations there. Latino votes at about 200,000. They're trying to get more folks to come out to vote. And there's a drop off typically between the general election and runoffs of 40%. Uh, but in the last general election, they elected their first Latina uh, uh, district attorney, Deborah Gonzalez. So with these slim margins, every vote counts. Democrats have got to work hard, pretend you're behind, and deliver that vote because it's going to be a razor thin margin. And how about this? Regardless of who wins, I like to see democracy in action. and. Latinos need to go out and vote. All right, Bob Price, need to get your analysis on this race. How do the Republicans maintain control of the Senate by winning one or both of these races? Well, this is a very unusual election. It's, it's very unusual that you have two senators that are from the same state 
on the ballot at the same time. And it's really even more unusual that those two senators control the fate of who's going to control the United States Senate for the next two years. So uh, it, it's a very important election. The president of the United States traveled to Valdosta, Georgia last night and made it absolutely crystal clear that he needs, regardless of the outcome of the presidential election, he needs these two people to be reelected into the Senate to maintain Republican control, either to protect his legacy if he leaves office or to help him enact legislation that he will move forward with in his next administration. So it's vitally important that every person vote out there. I do not understand the least bit any Republican coming out and trying to suppress the vote in the, this all important Senate race. This is all the marbles in this race. Everybody needs to get in it. Tomorrow, Bell, Joe Biden does not win Georgia without a very, very large African-American turnout. Uh, but Kamala Harris isn't on this ballot. We're talking about two Democrats. Will they show up in the same numbers that they did during the general election? Absolutely. Uh, uh, um, pastor Warnock is the pastor of the historic Ebenezer Baptist Church, which Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. used to be the pastor of. I have family members who attend that church. I talk to them. We've talked more now than we've ever talked because Bob is right in one point. This is historic. You never have two senators from one state that can affect the whole nation and affect the Senate. This is amazing. And yes, I believe they're gonna come out in bigger numbers. I really do because they understand the fate that lies in their hand for the new Biden administration. They know the fate, whether it is a Republican Senate or closer margin or a Democratic Senate, if the fate lies with Georgia and they know it. So we don't want the lights to go out in Georgia. If you got friends, rather than something to vote. Okay, Carmen Rowe, as a moderate independent, do you like the idea of a Republican firewall in the Senate? And do you think that will be an impetus for, for folks voting for the Republicans? You know, I, absolutely, I think we need a firewall. I, you know, that's what democracy is all about. And having one person running the entire table is something that I don't think anybody wants or should want if you believe in democracy. But I do think that this is a critical race. It's historical, it's, it's significant beyond measure. But what's ironic is that the Republicans have gone around and undermined their efforts by saying all this stuff about voter fraud. So then the Republicans aren't coming out the way that they would otherwise be coming out because they believe it's all, you know, for naught. And so it's it's funny to me the irony in the Republican Party pushing so hard about voter fraud and that it may end up, you know, being Georgia is the price for that. And so we'll see what happens. But that's a very real concern that's that's on the ground in Georgia. All right, we're gonna keep our eyes on it. Up next, the pain of this pandemic just keeps getting deeper with vaccines days from shipment. America suffers record casualties from this stubborn and deadly contagion. Welcome back. On Wednesday, coronavirus claimed 2,760 American lives a death toll greater than any single day of this miserable pandemic. The director of the CDC warned this winter may well be the most difficult time in the public health history of the United States. The grim assessment comes as Great Britain began distributing vaccine ahead of our own nation, which likely won't begin initial dispersals until mid-month. Meantime, the surge in hospitalizations has triggered the return of restrictions in North Texas where bars have been forced to close and non-essential businesses ordered to reduce capacity. Panel, this virus seems to be getting more insidious as we wait impatiently for vaccines to become available. Tomorrow, Bell, you've been out there on the front lines uh, getting material to folks. What's your take? The, the toll that this, this virus is doing, it has so many tentacles because the, the lives that we're losing and the impact on those who remain after they've lost those lives is devastating. Not only that, the economic toll. I was at the George R. Brown for Thanksgiving. Uh, thanks to Bishop Woodard and Citywide Club, they gave out over 20,000 uh, uh, food meals to, to people out there. And it was just the people were steady coming. I think the Houstonians they gave, because I'm telling you this toll, uh, people don't understand psychologically, physically, mentally, COVID is hitting every specter 
of our existence. And so I'm, I'm happy to see that the vaccine is coming because people need some hope. They're looking for something to hope in. Bob Price, you have been dead solid serious about the danger of this, this pandemic from the very beginning. Uh, what's your take? Well, thank God President Trump created Operation Streamline that's moving this vaccine process through at a record pace and is going to deliver relief at some point in the very near future to Americans across the country. But what we're seeing here now is a, a very interesting dichotomy between the dictatorial powers of the left trying to shut people down. In San Antonio, you can't even go in your backyard over Thanksgiving weekend. It, you know, it's just ridiculous. The curfews in cities, shutting down restaurants with no scientific basis whatsoever for shutting them down, especially outdoor dining. And then on the other extreme, you've got these people out there that refuse to wear a mask because it's some kind of a political statement. This isn't about politics, it's about surviving until we get this vaccine, until we can get this virus under control. And people on both sides need to step back and treat this thing seriously, but quit overreacting. This, this whole stealing people's liberty is ridiculous. Carmen Rowe, you know intimately the backlog this has created in our criminal justice system. Can you give us uh, some insight into that? Yeah, I mean, obviously everything came to a screeching halt and we're slowly getting back into uh, some sort of uh, semblance of normalcy, but it's very difficult and everything has to change during the COVID. The most concerning thing is these surges that are now coming and the CDC suggests that we're gonna have another one mid-January, that the vaccine isn't gonna be enough even for those first responders. So it's gonna be months, if not mid, mid next year, end of the year before we can get back to anything that looks like a jury trial. While some states or some areas in the state, excuse me, are pushing for jury trials right away. The truth is we can't do that safely now and we likely won't be able to do it for several months. Tony, can you say what you need to say in 30 seconds? Well, how about this? I'm happy that the vaccine's coming. That should give us the fortitude to have the self-discipline to control what we can. That means we know if we wear a mask or not, we know if we bubble, we know if we're gonna respect our elders by staying away from folks who may be sick or pretending we are sick. We gotta do that right now to survive, to get to the vaccine. So that's really all we can control. This other chaos, I really wish Donald Trump would have handled this more with, with more wisdom from the beginning. All right, we're gonna leave it right there. Still ahead, welcome relief on the way for Houstonians left jobless by the pandemic. Will 30 million in emergency COVID aid from the city bridge the gap for households facing eviction? Welcome back with COVID-19 still stripping tens of thousands of Houstonians of their homes and livelihoods. Mayor Sylvester Turner in concert with a unanimous city council approved the dispersal of 30 million federal dollars to financially stressed households throughout the metro. The aid will take the form of $1,200 one-time payments to be issued with no restrictions to qualifying applicants who earn no more than 80% of our city's median income. They need to pay for their utilities. They can do that. If they need to pay for their rent, they can do that. So we didn't want, we didn't want the criteria to be so restrictive that it becomes frustrating for people who find themselves in need. Uh, so we, we're not putting a lot of strings on it, but we're saying to people, you know your situation better than we do. Panel with 25,000 families likely to receive aid, there were concerns expressed that too much of this money may go to non-essentials and not enough to food, rent, and utilities. Charles Blaine, you keep a close eye on City Hall. What's your take? Yeah, listen, I agree with the mayor on this one. And, and data shows that one-time cash payments like this that are you, that are given for assistance are more often than not spent on short-term debt, housing, food, utilities, and things like that. There's an ignorant misconception that people go out and buy Jordans or drugs with this money that's given when that's not the case. More often than not, people use it to get them out of whatever situation they're in. But the issue that we're seeing is a lot of cities across the country are using this as a template to move to a guaranteed basic income and kind of keep these reoccurring 1200 1500 dollars $1,800 payments month after month for these same folks. And so I don't want us to get to that point, but one-term cash payments to help them get out of this situation, which government put us in, I think is perfectly fine. Okay, Tamara Bell, are you concerned about how this money is being distributed? 
Yes, I do hope that when they're distributing it, it, I, it would be great if they did it on a first come first basis with you qualifying. That's what I'm hoping for because teamwork is what we need. Uh, I wanted to get back to what I was saying about how so many Houstonians helped other Houstonians who are hurting. But like Charles said, they don't have a choice but to use this on essentials because there is nobody making money and now they don't have the $600 extra in unemployment. So they need food. So I wanted to thank, I really do, Turkey Leg Hut, uh, Chef uh, Don Boy, DeAndre Hopkins and Laramie Tuzzo and all the thousands of Houstonians who also helped feed Houston's uh, uh, people community for Thanksgiving. It takes a team to get it done. All right, Bob Price, conservative council member Greg Travis uh, voted for this, but he also said, you know, we have no way of knowing whether this money's been spent on liquor and, and cigarettes. Do you have concerns? Well, anytime you're giving unrestricted money, there should be concern about how it's being used. But I'm grateful that President Trump signed the CARES Act that provided these funds to go to the public. And, and also the, the Trump administration through the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention uh, issued a moratorium against evictions that began in September and goes through the end of this year. And it'll probably be extended beyond that where people only need to fill out an affidavit that says that they would be otherwise homeless and they can't pay their rent because they lost their job or whatever their economic condition is and you cannot be evicted. So there's a lot of relief out there for people. They need to be aware of how to get it and, and move forward with it. I'm glad that the, the money is going to be going out to people that need it. Tony, is this aid going to make it to the Latino community, particularly those who may be uh, single language households? Well, the good news is that Baker Ripley does have a good foothold in the Latino community. So they've actually got a database of folks in the community that they've worked with. They've done a lot of different events for outreach throughout their decades of existence. They're almost 100 years old. So I trust them to reaching more of Latino families than others. Like tomorrow, Bell said, though, let's make sure that everybody knows the rules and that we're helping families that really need the help. However, I also dismiss this whole idea that families are going to misuse it. 25,000 families are going to get help. They need it. Should be more help. I wish the national uh, elected officials would also do this right now before the end of the year. They should have been working on it as well. Proud of Houston for stepping up for our families. National institutions should be doing more. Okay, Carmen Bell, final 45 seconds goes to you. Do you approve these one-time, no strings attack, uh, attached payments? You know, I think you have to look at this in a bigger picture. I don't know Baker Ripley personally, but I do know that the money that has been allocated in the past hasn't made it to the people that need it the most. And so what we have is $30 million that they had to do something with as somebody seemingly woke up and was like, let's just give them checks because we can't figure out how to do it. And as regards the evictions, Texas stands alone as the as the having the highest number of evictions and putting people out of their homes as any other state in the nation. So where did all that money go? And why didn't it help the people so that we weren't the highest you know, state alone that evicted people. So again, I think this mismanagement from Sylvester Turner and the commissioner's court with all this money that could go to people is, is a constant theme with this administration. $30 million goes to 27 or 20,000 people. That's nowhere near what it should be. But most importantly, these are people who haven't already received aid. And so those are the only people that are gonna be helped with $30 million. I have a problem with that. I don't care how they spend it. All right, we're going to keep an eye on it. Up next, did Harris County break state law by stripping power from locally chosen leaders and appointing an election coordinator? That controversy is up for discussion when What's Your Point returns. Welcome back. Harris County's newly created position of election administrator has come under fire from Texas Attorney General Ken Paxson himself operating under a cloud of controversy, but I digress. Paxton claims the, the appointed position was created illegally because Harris County failed to notify the Texas Secretary of State of the move in a timely fashion. This week, the Democratic majority on commissioner's court disagreed with Precinct 1's Rodney Ellis accusing the AG of, quote, attacking voting rights. Panel, the position of election administrator has been a lightning rod for criticism since it was proposed because it strips historic authority from both the county clerk and the tax assessor collector, both of which were elected by voters. Tamara Bell, you spoke uh, out about this at commissioner's court this week. 
Yes, this is very concerning. And for this to occur in the middle of COVID, many people were not watching it because you cannot go into commissioner's court. You have to watch it online. So what was supposed to be a discussion of the creation of this position ended up at that very meeting creating the position. This is a big concern. The citizens of Houston and the citizens of Harris County elected in March an individual to be over our elections and to be over voter registration. Because the person that's sitting around the horseshoes, people did not win. And now he came up with this idea. Over, over, over thousands of people voted that they wanted their elections controlled by the people. And instead, three people, Rodney Ellis, Lena Hidalgo, and Adrian Garcia, voted to take that power from the people and give it to themselves and an employee. This person is an employee. They have no, no, no answering to the general public. And this is a concern because Tanisha Hutspeth is the new county clerk and Ann Bennett Harris is the tax assessor. Two African-American females for the first time in the history of Harris County are running this. If it had been an all white commissioner's court, they would have been tearing down the building saying this is racist. You wanna talk about a suppression of voters' rights? This is a suppression of voter rights, not Jim Crow. This is about his control. Charles Blaine, you've been keeping an eye on this situation. What's your read? I'm in 100% agreement with tomorrow. They want to accuse Attorney General Paxson of suppressing voters, but yet they're removing a posi- they're removing duties from a duly elected elected official, people who uh, are you know held accountable to the taxpayers and to the voters at every election cycle, and they're giving it to an insular position that's decided by already elected officials and it's unaccountable to voters and inaccessible to voters. So I think that's the problem. And then they did it in the dark of night. This is an election position, and they did it. I think it was the first day of early voting when everybody was at the polls anyway and nobody who would testify on this because they had an interest in the issue could be there because they were busy testifying and i think tomorrow was at the polls that day and I, did you leave to go to the to come or something it was a big issue because people could not come and speak out about it and then they had democrats calling in saying that this was a bad idea but they pushed it through anyway so i mean it's a terrible idea and to accuse the attorney general of trying to suppress voters when you're actually removing this from the hands of the voters is just dishonest All right, we're gonna leave it right there, but we're gonna keep an eye on the issue. Coming up, does the post of Houston mayor have too much power? A new bid to strengthen the hand of Houston city council members is our next topic, so stick around. Welcome back with the 2020 election in the rear view mirror. It's appropriate to look ahead to voter decision-making to come as in a proactive charter amendment proposed here in Houston, which would increase the power of city council at the expense of the mayor. Backed by the firefighters union and a coalition of activists, including our own Charles Blaine, the measure would allow as few as three council members in agreement to place an item on the agenda for consideration. Currently that authority resides solely with the mayor. The Charter Amendment proposal has drawn support from both the right and the left, with advocates claiming it will give citizens a greater voice at City Hall. For his part, Mayor Turner told the Houston Chronicle he believes the measure would uh, create chaos and confusion. Panel, the coalition needs 20,000 signatures to get this on the ballot. Should they? Okay, Charles Blaine, why should people sign up to make this choice? They should sign up because we need representation in our communities. Here's the issue with the city of Houston. Unless you are a prominent activist that you have the backing of a large group or you've got the ear of a council member, when you go testify, your issue is not really going to get heard. And even if you do have the ear of a council member, unless that council member is in favor with the mayor, the issue is not going to come up. So what you need is the ability to wrangle council members to put something on the agenda with ease. And so I think this is going to solve that problem. It's going to give voters, uh, taxpayers across the city an opportunity to actually have their issues from their communities heard. And so we definitely need this. We'll put us in line with every other big city in Texas, and it's not going to cause chaos and confusion. It's just going to put us in line with other cities. Bob, based upon that explanation, you you, you think this is a good move? I I think anytime you bring the Houston Young Republicans and the Democratic Socialists of America online on the same issue, there's probably some merit to that. So absolutely, you know, the, the mayor historically in Houston has always had the power to keep this, but Mayor Turner has, has specifically used it even stronger to as an act of retaliation against council members that don't comply with his dictatorial powers. 
so that they can't bring up any issues that are important to their specific district. So we need to be able to do this, whether you're on the left or the right, it's important that issues get before the council so they can be discussed and be voted on. Okay, Carmen Rose, a longtime citizen of this city, does this charter amendment make sense to you? No question. And, and I think what Bob said is right. I think Sylvester's pushed retaliation and other uh, you know measures through in, in a lot of different ways and and it's a lot of centralized power and that's not a good thing for anybody houston's one of the only cities as charles said that actually still does this and so we need to take the power out of the hands of one man and put it into the hands of the people and i think the retaliation against the firefighters and all the other different areas that we've looked into with sylvester turner over his last two terms is evidence enough to uh, make it clear that we need to do this here in the city of Houston. Okay, as a political influencer of uh, significant proportion, tomorrow, Bell, what's your take on this? I absolutely think that this needs to be done because being involved in super neighborhood and wanting to bring up issues and bring uh, clear issues, and then, I mean, and I'm talking about some that affect the whole city. Some council members were like, well, I don't wanna upset the mayor. And I'm not talking about with just Sylvester. Let me make that clear. I'm talking about going back to Bill White, going back to Lanier. I mean, you just you just didn't wanna challenge him because you was like, oh, it'll hurt my, hurt my district. I think this is a very good measure to be more inclusive of all citizens, uh, whether you're in the uh, bottoms, whether you're in uh, Third Ward, whether you're in Edo, whether you're in the Heights, whether you're in River Oaks, whether you're in Memorial, Spring Branch, it doesn't matter. Everybody should be able to feel that they can come to their council and speak about what their needs are. Okay, Tony, final word goes to you. Is our strong mayor uh, style of government too strong? And, and do you like this as an enhancement of democracy? Yeah, the fact that Houston is mayor centric is no secret. I think what's fascinating is to have this discussion one button ain't gonna change it though, because you can go as far back as Hall Fines, who basically came up with the infrastructure to make this very mayor-centric. Dr. Steven Kleinberg has this great book about Houston called Prophetic City, where he breaks down some of those elements. I would like to see Houston talk about the whole notion of that, but you can't leave behind the fact that there's only one Latino city council representatives. Let's also look at how these basic seats are elected and let's look at the whole picture, especially as Mayor Turner's in his last term. Let's see what the next legacy and what, what the next era looks like. So great conversation to have, but we ain't done with it. This is just the beginning. All right, we're leaving it there. When we come back, rising violent crime in the Bayou City has inspired a longtime passer to call out local leaders and label Houston the next Chicago unless something is done soon. Welcome back. With Houston on track to record the most murders in a quarter century, well-known local pastor Willie Davis is demanding action before more lives are lost. We spoke one-on-one -on -one about why he believes Houston is becoming increasingly lawless. Criminals take the opportunity, and I hear it from my members all the time. Well, Reverend Willie Davis has pastored in his hometown of Houston for much of his adult life, the crime he's been seeing here lately reminds him of four turbulent years he spent ministering on the south side of Chicago. In Chicago, the people on the street, you know what their complaint is? When they put these guys, they arrest these guys for these shootings, they let them go. The same thing that we're doing right here, what's happening in Cook County, is not happening in Harris County. And for any of us to turn our head to that is ridiculous. And so Pastor Davis is speaking out against the so-called progressive criminal court judges who've granted bond to hundreds of violent repeat felony offenders. But when you're letting murderers out, people who are armed robbing and carjacking people and doing bodily harm, as well as killing people, what kind of representation is that? As homicide and other criminal activity continue to spike, Davis warns of an eventual exodus of both businesses and residents if the community fails to demand from city and county leaders decisive action against those who break the law. Many people in this city is not gonna take this crime thing serious until it comes on their door, until it knocks on their door 
it enters their family, and then we're going to hear it. Pastor Davis's outcry comes as Crime Stoppers released a truly troubling number of the 69 victims killed by defendants out on bond. 51 were Houstonians of color. I'm the leader of a major Texas city urges his citizens to stay home and then gets busted breaking his own guidance. Our panel is set to dive in after this short break. Welcome back in what can only be described as a deeply embarrassing case of do what I say, not what I do. Austin's mayor, Steve Adler, has issued an apology after the revelation. He traveled to the Mexican resort of Cabo San Lucas aboard a private jet with seven guests who had attended his daughter's wedding. Trouble is, Mayor Adler had repeatedly urged his constituents in the capital city to avoid travel as a precaution against additional spread of COVID-19. Adler's misstep became a notch deeper with confirmation. He posted a Facebook message from Cabo urging Austinites to stay home. Panel Mayor Adler now says he's set a bad example and regrets the travel. Bob Price, drop the hammer. Well, he regrets getting caught. So he joins the long list of dictatorial authoritarian Democrats who are trying to tell people what they should be doing. That includes Nancy Pelosi, Andrew Cuomo, Governor Gretchen Whitmer, Bill de Blasio, Lori Lightfoot, Gavin Newsom, and many, many, many others. Tomorrow, Bill, what's your take? He joins uh, disingenuous Republicans who forgot to put the party in. If you don't have a private jet, keep your ass at home. If you got a private jet, then you can travel. Tony Diaz, what's your take on this? He's a Democrat. Stop acting like Trump. You're a Democrat, so you're not above the law. The only thing worse is when you see like a someone parking in a handicapped spot that shouldn't be in there, or you know when someone speeds because they're law enforcement or police, and, and they shouldn't be able to do that. So you're not above the law. Stop acting like Trump and lead through example. Charles Blaine, 15 seconds. Listen, Austin's mayor is not the only one. Like Bob said, you have Michael Hancock, the mayor of Denver, who violated his travel rules, went to Mississippi with family. San Francisco's mayor, London Breed, was at a Michelin star restaurant when you're not supposed to be going to restaurants. Washington, D.C.'s mayor violated her quarantine rules to go congratulate Joe Biden. Its mayor has gone wild. They have no regard for the public. <laughs> Five seconds. A man, who defund, a man who defunded the police in Austin is now on a beach in Cabo telling people they shouldn't get out of their homes hypocrisy. Leaving it there. Thanks for joining us. The conversation continues on a national level next with Fox News Sunday and host Chris Wallace. From all of us here, have a safe and healthy week.